Okay, this is a continuation of the Q&A that we uh, are re-recording from Sunday night. And this next question came from Sister Debbie, and it is basically um, worded as such. Can a young child be saved? Um, how old do they have to be in order to be able to be saved? Um, and then, um, I think that's pretty much the gist of that question. So the question centers around, you know, young children being saved. And um, is there a certain magic number, I guess you could say, um, that God uses to determine when when or not he's going to save them? Well, the answer to the question is, can a young child be saved? Yes. Young children can and often are saved when they're exposed to the gospel. Um, there are several instances in the Bible where God bears this out. Uh, I'll give you a couple of the Old Testament uh, examples. Um, Samuel, for example, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 20. Let's look at that one. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, we see over here in verse 20. The Bible says in verse 20, Wherefore it came to pass, when the time was come after Hannah had conceived, that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice in his bowel. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. And Elkaniah her husband said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good, tarry until thou hast weaned him, only the Lord establish his word. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him into the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. Notice that. He was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. They bring him to the temple there. And she said, O oh my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. That brings up another point, um, you know, about dedications and um Making dedications for children when they're born, you know, dedicating them to the Lord, uh, is that biblical? Well, here's an example where it was actually done, um, and you, you lay them on the altar and you commit them to the Lord. I think it's a very good practice that every Christian should do with their children is dedicate them to God when they're born and ask God to look over them and watch them, watch over them and protect them. Um, Dedications are really um, important. Uh, you don't see as many of them done today as you used to. I think we should get back to that with our children and dedicate them to the Lord. Um, but going further here, I want you to see that God responded to the child. Look at verse, uh, chapter 3. In chapter 3, we read the following. In chapter 3, verse 19, the Bible says... Well, not, not 19, I'm sorry. In chapter 3, verse 1, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. So here's an example where a child is dedicated to God, and he's ministering to the Lord in the temple. Now we say temple there, of course, at this point in Scripture, there's no actual temple like Solomon's temple. Uh, the tabernacle is what's being referred to, and it is referred to as the temple. But he's ministering to the Lord there, and God is um, beginning to speak to Samuel. In fact, he speaks to him uh, three different times here in chapter 3, and begins to uh, reveal himself to Samuel, and he's a young child, the Bible says. Now, speculation is that he's around three years old when this takes place. 
Um, and, and where people get the idea that he's between two and three is because when Hannah uh, brought him to the temple, the Bible says she had to wean him first before he was brought. Now, the weaning process typically is uh, the age of two or three, and then you wean the child, and then, you know, they, they're able to... Um, to be um, on their own, per, per se, as far as uh, not having to nurse from their mother. And um, so that's where the idea comes in that he was around three years old. Now look at verse 19 of chapter 3. It says, in verse 19, it says, And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. And in verse 21, And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Here's a young child that God's revealing his word to. Uh, young children are more receptive and more sensitive to the uh, prompting and moving of the Spirit of God than a lot of adults are. They're sensitive to it. They, um, they have a heart for it. Um, they've not been educated out of the experience of knowing God, so their their heart is more tender to God, and so absolutely, I believe children uh, at a very young age can definitely be saved and definitely respond to the Lord. All right, I'm going to give you a couple of more examples here. Um, there's Josiah. Go to Second Kings chapter 22. 2 Kings chapter 22. Uh, here's an example. Uh, 2 Kings 22. Let me get over here. All right. In verses 1 and 2. Verses 1 and 2. Josiah was 8 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 31 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jedidiah, the daughter of Adai of Boscoth. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of David his father and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. Now here, um, just to give you some context of this, is a young man, eight years old to be exact, who becomes king over Israel. And the Bible says that he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. Now keep in mind, when a king took the throne, he was anointed by the priest to become king. So he had the anointing of God on him. And he was approved of God in that, in that situation. And the Bible says he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And if he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, that means he was pleasing to God. So in the Old Testament sense, here's a young man that's serving God at a very young age, the age of eight, to be exact. Now we've got David. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Let's look at this one. Here's another young man that God calls and chooses to do a work for him. We all know the story of David and all the different things he did and how God was working through him. 1 Samuel chapter 16. Look at verse 11. The Bible says in verse 11, And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? He said, There remaineth yet the youngest, Behold, he keepeth the sheep. Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And uh, he sent and brought him. Now he was ready, with all of a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now, David, a young man, um, again, this is um, the traditional thought here, is that he was around the age of 14 uh, when this took place. Um you know, the Bible doesn't really give an age here, so, but we do know he was young. And if you read some of the other chapters before this where David encounters the lion and encounters different things and 
as a young man, God was content, continuously ministering through him and continuing to do things through David. David started out as a young man, and he started out serving God, and the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. Look at, um, look at verse 7 of chapter 16. But the Lord said to Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord saith not as man saith, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Jesse, in his mind, when Samuel came to anoint one of his sons as kings, he assumed that it was going to be the oldest son, a, a son that had experience, a son that had some age on him, and, um, you know, had some, um, some life lessons that had been given to him. But God told Samuel, don't you look at his appearance. Don't look at his countenance. Uh, God doesn't see like men see. Uh, God looks at the heart, and that's the key. And uh, that answers the question of when can a person be saved. Well, it depends on when their heart is touched by the Lord, and that heart responds. Uh, now, just as I've given you a, a few examples here of Old Testament saints that were young and responded to God and were good and right, I could also give you some more examples of young people in the Old Testament that were wicked in the eyes of the Lord. Um, and, you know, that's, that's because their heart rejected the word of the Lord. So it really depends on how that soul responds to God's spirit. It does not always depend on the environment that they are raised in. There's examples of that here in uh, First and Second Chronicles and First and Second Kings, where people were raised by wicked people, yet they turned out to be great champions for the Lord in the kingdom. So I can give you an example of my own life. You know, I was raised in a home that. Um, didn't honor God and didn't believe in the things of God. And yet, despite all that, I, I rose up to be who I am today uh, by God's grace and mercy. So, I mean, you, you can't always go by the environment, although the environment does play a part in uh, molding and shaping people. Now, look at Matthew chapter 19, verse 14. 19, 14. This is another verse you need to look at because uh, this verse here is going to give you some um, criteria on this. It says in Matthew 19, 14, um, in verse 14, Jesus said, Suffer the little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. What was going on? Verse 13, Then were there brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray, and the disciples rebuked them. I've seen Christians do that with uh, children that come to church, and, you know, in their innocent way, they're praising God, and in their innocent way, they're reading the Bible, you know, and they might even be pretending to preach or pretending to do something, you know, uh, that they're watching and observing in the church. You know, they're clapping their hands, they're raising their hands to the Lord, they're, they're giving praises to God, and there'll be always that person in the church that says, well, you shouldn't let them do that. That's disrespectful. That's, um, you know, that's balking God. No, actually it's not. Jesus said, you're to suffer the little children to come to him, and you're not to rebuke them. When they're praising God, you need to let them praise God. And um, if, if they hold their peace, the Bible says the rocks will cry out. Uh, Matthew 19, 14 makes it very clear. You're to suffer those little children to come to Jesus Christ. And if they're praising God, thank God for it, because uh, they could be doing a whole lot of other things that are not good spiritually. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, you've got this. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12, it says, <clears throat> Let no man despise thy youth. Here's a young preacher, Timothy, again. A young man that was as young as possibly 12 years old when he entered the ministry. 
Um, but some believe it was around 14 or 15. Nevertheless, he was a young man. But, but Paul tells Timothy, don't let anybody despise thy youth. A lot of people in church despise young people that are trying to do something for God because they have no experience. But I'm here to tell you, they have a lot to bring to the table and they have a lot to offer. And their hearts are tender and their hearts are in tune with the Word of God and the, the things of God. You need to let God work in their life and not hinder that. I've seen a lot of uh, people run people out of the church, young people, because um, they wanted them to act a certain way or do a certain way and and just shut down any th- kind of praise and worship or service for the Lord that that young person was trying to do. The Bible says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. So that's the answer there. Several examples uh, can be given to young people that are saved and used of God and, and they started at a very young age. So that's the answer to that question. Can young people be saved? The answer is absolutely yes. Now, what's the magic number? There is no magic number. Uh, I've seen God save children as young as four and five years old. Um, I've seen God save children as young as eight and nine and ten. I was ten when I got saved. Um, A lot of people, you know, say, oh, it's just a phase, you know, they'll, they'll grow out of it. I've had religious people tell me that, even about my own conversion when I first got saved. You know, it's just a religious phase, you know, he's going through, he'll grow out of it after a while. Um, and these are coming from, these are responses coming from Christians. What a shame. What a shame. Um, don't put a hint, don't put a, uh, uh, a hindrance on what God can and can't do. The, the magic number, if there were one, is not 12. Uh, people get that because Jesus was 12 when he was in the temple. No, 12 is not the age of accountability. The age of accountability is when that child hears the truth of the gospel and responds to it in his heart and receives it. And that age can vary depending on the child and depending on how God deals with that child and what kind of work God is wanting to do in that child's life. Um, I've known some preachers that uh, God has greatly used that got saved when they were four and five years old. And um, it's not impossible. Uh, with, you know, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So that's the answer to that question. All right, that's the answer to that one. And we'll move right along to this next one here. Um, the next question here on the... Uh, thing here comes from Sister Debbie. It says um, she's she's concerned that when she's reading the Bible, um, but yet not retaining the knowledge of what she's reading, and is that an issue? No, that's not an issue. A lot of times when we read the Bible, um, we read it um, not realizing how much we're actually retaining. A lot of times when you're reading this book, God is pouring into your spirit man a lot of things that your natural man's not comprehending. Um, Your subconscious, if you will, is taking in a lot more than you realize. A lot of times when I'm reading my Bible, uh, a lot of times I read it and it's just as dry as the day is long, and I'm sitting there trying to think, my God, I'm not getting anything out of this today. And later on down the road, um, that thing that I didn't think I was retaining will come right back to my memory and God will bring it up and say, remember when you read this over here? Now look at it and apply it to this over here and it connects. And you're getting more than what you realize. What that is is a trick of the devil trying to get you discouraged so you'll quit reading the Bible. So if you're reading your Bible at times and you feel like you're not getting anything out of it, don't stop reading. Keep reading it. Just keep right on reading it. Discipline yourself to read the Word, even when you feel like you're not getting anything out of it. I promise you, after a while, you'll realize you're getting a whole lot more than you think you are. Now, let me give you some scriptures on that. Look at Psalm chapter 119. Psalm 119. 
in Psalm 119, we read in verse 11. It's a really good chapter on the Word of God. Psalm 119 is. Look at verse 11. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid. See that thing? You hide it in there. And it's going into your heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It's hidden in there. If you're reading it, God's hiding it down in that heart. And it'll come back up after a while and God will use that word to minister to you or help you in a situation or situations you might find yourself faced with or to minister to somebody that needs to hear it. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Uh, look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. And look at verse 13. The Bible says, till I come, give attendance to what? Reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Now notice that. Give attendance to reading. In other words, keep reading the Word of God. Um, neglect not the gift that is in thee. See? That word, every time you're reading it, is getting down on the inside of you. And that's what he's talking about. Now, I'll give you another thing on this, too, that you need to think about when you're reading. Sometimes, when you're reading the Scriptures, and you don't have an understanding of what's going on with them, this is where the local church comes into play and becomes an important part of your reading time. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8. So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. This is why coming to church is important. I know when um, I was uh, getting started into the ministry and uh, attending church, you know, and listening to the preachers that were over me and the Lord and uh, my mentors and stuff like Dr. Ruckman and so forth. Uh, a lot of times I, I couldn't understand certain things and God used those preachers, those pastors to come in behind what I had read and gave me an understanding of what I was lacking in. And that's the purpose of the ministry of the church and the pastors and the teachers and the preachers is to give you the sense of the understanding. Um, and don't forget, you know, the Holy Ghost is there to teach you and to show you the Word of God. Now, he'll use the preacher sometimes to do that. He'll use uh, book sources to help you with that. Sometimes you might be reading a book on a subject that you're having a hard time with, and God will open up the truth of that subject to you through a book that somebody has written. Uh, as you're going through the Scriptures, they'll help you kind of put the Scriptures together to make sense of it. So... Uh, my short answer there on, on the question is just because you don't feel like you're retaining the word uh, when you're reading it or retaining the knowledge of what you're reading, don't let that discourage you and don't make that, don't let that be um, something that you feel like you're doing something wrong um, and, and God's just cut his knowledge off from you. Just keep reading. Sometimes the Lord will hold back some things from you to see if you're really hungry for it. And if you're really hungry for it, you'll keep coming back to it until you get the answer that you're looking. So um, keep reading your Bible. Keep reading your Bible. That's very important. That's the one thing the devil wants you to stop doing is read that book. All right, we're going to move on to the next question here um, that was given by Brother Chuck. It is, what is or was the unpardonable sin? <clears throat> Excuse me. So to answer this question, um, let's begin with the passage that everybody um, goes to when this question's asked, and that's Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. What is the unpardonable sin? Is that something 
that can be committed today, or is that something that uh, was in a certain dispensation? Um, and how does that apply to you as a Christian? Um, a lot of people um, over the years have tried to tackle this question and answer it in different kinds of ways. I've read several books on it um, to get a good perspective from different um, brothers in Christ on what they thought this unpardonable sin was. Uh, the scripture does have the answer. And the answer to the question um, really is a... Um, there's three, there's three answers to this question as far as the unpardonable sin. The first answer is going to be found here in Matthew chapter 12. And I'm going to give you the comparison verses and then we'll, we'll run through it, okay? Alright, so the first place we're going to look at is Matthew 12, verse 31. Matthew 12, 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. Now, the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost and speaking against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now, that's a reference to the millennial kingdom when Christ is reigning on the throne. So what exactly is this unpardonable sin in this, in this situation? To answer this question in Matthew 12, you have to go and compare it with Mark chapter 3 where the same thing is being talked about. In Mark chapter 3 verse 29, let's see what Jesus says there. In Mark 3 29, he says the following. He says in verse 29, he says, But he that blasphemes against the Holy Ghost hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. Now look at verse 30. He says in verse 30, Because they said, He hath an unclean spirit. Now the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost is defined as someone looking at the work of Jesus Christ and watching the miracles and watching the things that he was doing in the flesh and turning around and saying that he was doing that by an unclean spirit. That's the definition. So when you look at that, there, there's the definition of it. To be precise, it is saying that Jesus Christ has an unclean spirit inside of him. This can only happen or be done while Jesus was on the earth physically working and doing what he did by the power of the Holy Ghost. You had to know Jesus after the flesh. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.16. There's only two times this particular sin that we're reading about in Matthew 12 and Mark chapter 3 could be committed based on that. You say, what is it? Well, the first advent, which is here where Jesus was... Um, among the Pharisees when he said this at the first advent during his first coming to the earth and in the millennial reign that's the only two times it could happen because again he is here on the earth in the flesh during the millennial reign during the church age it is impossible to commit this sin because Jesus is not physically present in the flesh alright so the question comes up well okay if we can't commit that sin, uh, specifically mentioned in Matthew 12 and Mark 3, is there an unpardonable sin that can be committed in the church age that cannot be forgiven? The short answer is yes, there is. You say, what is it? That is final rejection and total rejection of God, the gospel of God's grace through Jesus Christ and if you reject that gospel once it's presented to you and you continue to reject that until your dying breath and you take your last breath in rejection of the gospel, 
you will land in hell and at that point you will never be able to be saved again in other words if you die in a lost state once you enter into the gates of hell there is no hope for you you can never be saved again you're you're eternally damned however if they reject jesus and die in that state of rejection they're they're going to hell and they're going to they're going to stay lost forever look at john chapter 3 uh, he makes that clear in John chapter 3. In John chapter 3, we see the following. 36. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. That's if the person receives Christ, they are, they're saved. Right now. They don't have to wait to die to get saved. They're saved right now. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And that wrath will stay on him. And if he rejects Christ until his dying breath, it will be there with him throughout eternity. All right. The third and final situation is after the rapture when the church is gone. Is there an unpardonable sin that shows up during the tribulation period? The answer is yes, there again. There is an unpardonable sin that shows up in the tribulation period. You say, what is that, preacher? If a person takes the mark of the beast, that ends their possibility of being saved at the end of the tribulation period. Now, there's a few different verses here that we need to look at and put together here that are connected to this. The first one we need to look at is found in uh, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6, where this is brought up. And a lot of times Christians will try to use Hebrews 6, who these are Christians that believe you can lose your salvation. They'll try to use Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 as proof text that a person can lose their salvation after being saved. When the truth of the matter is, in Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10, these verses aren't aimed at Christians at all. They're aimed at people in the tribulation period who are under a faith and works uh, system uh, again the book of Hebrews is written to the Hebrews it's not written to Christians um, when you look at this and you see the things that are said in it you realize real quickly this couldn't possibly be referring to a Christian let's look at it real quick Hebrews 6 1 the Bible says therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ let us go on into perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and a faith toward God of the doctrine of baptisms, plural, and of laying on of hands. All right, the laying on of hands would be like the ordaining of ministers, elders, deacons, and uh, bishops, and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal uh, judgment. This we would do if God permit. For it is impossible, listen to it, for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come. If they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified in themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Now, when you read this verse, it makes it very clear, if these people fall away, they can't come back to Christ. Yet, those who use these verses to prove you can lose your salvation say, well, if you backslide or lose your salvation, you can come back to Christ. Well, we got a contradiction here because in Hebrews 6, it says, if you lose it, you can't get it back. So, we're in a situation here where somebody loses something, and once they lost it, they can't renew it again. The Bible says here in the next part of this verse, it says, for the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meat for them of whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected as nigh to cursing, whose end is to be burned. And then verse 9, he says, But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. So Paul here in this verse is saying, If you um, read these things that I'm talking about, you need to understand that if you're saved, I'm, I'm believing and having confidence in better things about you than this group of people that we're talking about. Now, in Hebrews 10, he goes a little further and gets in a little more detail about this. Hebrews 10, 26. Look at this one. 
And this is where we can start rightly dividing here and understand that this couldn't possibly be a Christian that he's referring to here. Hebrews 10.26 says, For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. Question, Christians, have you sinned willfully after you've been saved? And if the answer is yes, and you try to apply these verses to you, then you couldn't possibly be saved and you couldn't possibly get resaved once you lost it according to this the bible says if you sin willfully after that you receive the knowledge of the truth well what is the truth uh jesus christ said in john seventeen seventeen, the truth is the word of god the bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god and you will say by the word of god according to first peter chapter one now if you got the truth and you received it and it's inside of you, and then you sin willfully after that, the Bible says there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. In other words, the sacrifice of the cross won't cover what was done at that point, if you try to apply that to yourself. But there is a group of people that he's referring to here that we will see as we get further along that he's talking about. But a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. That's the second advent, folks. He that despised Moses' law, there's somebody that's under the law, died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who have trodden underfoot the Son of God, and have counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and have done despite unto the Spirit of grace. This is a group of people that are forced into a situation and they knowingly are willing to do what they're about to do and do it understanding the consequences. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, here's your clue, the Lord shall judge not the church, but his people, that's the Jews. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, let's look at John chapter, 1 John chapter 5. We'll see this sin show up again. 1 John chapter 5 verse 1. In 1 John chapter 5 verse 1, we see the following thing said about it. Again, this is a uh, dispensationally passage that's aimed at people in the tribulation period look at verse 16 first john chapter 5 verse 16 if any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death he shall ask and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death there is a sin unto death i do not say that he shall pray for it what is the sin unto death he keeps talking about He's talking about something specific that happens in the tribulation period that once it's committed, you can never come back from it. What could that be? Well, in order to get the answer to that, we have to go to the tribulation and see what's happening during that period of time. Revelation chapter 14, verse 9. The Bible says, And the third angel followed them with a loud voice. Excuse me, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The commandment of God during the tribulation period is, you to worship God, and you are to keep his commandments, and you're not to take that mark. And yet, here's a group of people that if they take that mark, they fall under the wrath of God, they drink the wine of the wrath of God, and they wind up in hell, or the lake of fire, and there's no possibility of being redeemed after that. 
That's in, he, that's in Revelation 14, 9 through 12. Now, that mark is described in Revelation 13, verse 14. In Revelation 13, 14, the Bible says, And deceiveth them that dwelleth on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the uh, sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by his sword and did live. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And that's what happens to anybody that refuses to take the mark of the beast in the tribulation period. The death sentence is pronounced over them. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. That no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Lay him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6, or 666. All right. Look at Revelation 15, uh, 2. He'll say it again. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses. See, this is uh, Jewish in nature. The servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works. Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Alright. Now, there is a spot uh, that is connected to this um, mark that is received. And I'll show you that in a few minutes. Uh, look at Revelation 16.2. I need to show you this one before we move further. The Bible says in verse 2, And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. Notice there is a noisome and grievous sore that is placed upon the men who take the mark of the beast. Now the reason I wanted to show you that is this spot or this sore is connected to leprosy. Look at Leviticus chapter 13. Now notice we were just in Revelation 13, which talked about the mark of the beast. Now we're in Leviticus 13. Um, and in Leviticus 13, he's going to talk about the leprosy and, and what it, how it's described. Leviticus 13. Look over here at verse 42. 1342, the Bible says, And if there be in the bald head or bald forehead a white reddish sore, it is a leprosy sprung up in his bald head or his bald forehead. Then the priest shall look upon it, and behold, if the rising of the sore be white reddish, in his bald head or in his bald forehead, as the leprosy appeareth in the skin of the flesh, he is a leprous man. He is unclean. The priest shall pronounce him utterly unclean. His plague is in his head. Notice it keeps saying in and not on. And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent and his head bare. He shall put a covering upon his upper lip and shall cry, unclean, unclean. He has to wear a mask. All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone. Without the camp shall his habitation be. There's a spot connected to that thing. Look at Leviticus chapter 13 verse 2. The Bible says in verse 2, And when a man shall have in the skin of his flesh arising a scab or bright spot, and it shall be in the skin of his flesh, like the plague of leprosy. Then he shall be brought unto Aaron the priest, or unto one of his sons the priest. And the priest shall look on the plague in the skin of his flesh, and when the hair in the plague is turned white, and the plague in the sight be deeper than the skin of his flesh, 
It is the plague of leprosy, and the priest shall look on him and pronounce him unclean. That's in Leviticus chapter 13, verses 2 through 3. Now, that spot is described in some of the epistles that are tribulation in nature. For example, 2 Peter chapter 2. Look at this. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. There's that 13 again. It says in verse 13, the Bible says, talking about these that are uh, wind up being, but look at verse 12, but these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime, spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. Alright, look at Jude. The book of Jude. And look at verse 12. In Jude verse 12, the Bible says, These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom reserve the blackness of darkness forever. And then look at verse 23. And others, he's talking about those that turn to God and try to trust in the Lord and the tribulation period. Others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Spotted by the flesh. Now, <clears throat> in the church age, the church of Jesus Christ and Jesus himself have no spots. They don't have this stuff going on with them. Let me show you in Song, Song of Solomon chapter 4. Song of Solomon, and we're going to close here in just a minute, so I'll show it to you. Song of Solomon chapter 4. Jesus Christ is described uh, being without spot. Let's look at Song of Solomon 4, verse 7. The Bible says in verse 7, Thou art all fair, my love. There is no spot in thee. There's no spot in thee. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. So there's a group with spots and there's a group that don't have spots. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 27. In verse 27, the Bible says that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Without blemish. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 14. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 14 says this. 1 Timothy 6 14. He says that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable until the coming, or the appearing rather, of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And then in Hebrews 9.14, Hebrews 9.14, says this in Hebrews 9.14, how, uh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The Antichrist, when he shows up in the tribulation period, he's bringing that leprous spot with him in the form of the mark of the beast. And once that spot is received in the skin, in the uh, hand, or in the forehead, it produces this leprous, grievous, noisome sore. And once you receive it, there's no turning back from it. So it becomes, for those in the tribulation period, the unpardonable sin, if you will. Um, and this is found in Revelation 13. You can find this in um, Leviticus 13 and 2 Peter 2.13. It's interesting that these 13s keep showing up because Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, that's 1 plus 12 equals 13. His name is called Judas Iscariot. He's, the, uh, he's got 13 letters in his name. And 
13 is the number for rebellion in the Bible. And when he shows up, he's rebelling against God, and he's rebelling against everything connected to God. So when you see that 13 show up in your Bible, pay attention to it, because somewhere in there it's probably connected to the Antichrist in some shape, form, or fashion. Read John chapter 13, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So hopefully that answered this question on the unpardonable sin and what it is. And if you're a Christian and you're worried about committing this sin, you couldn't possibly commit it if you tried. Um, a Christian cannot commit the unpardonable sin. Uh, it's just not a, a, God will kill you first before he allowed you to commit that sin. Um, the Bible says that you're saved and sealed until the day of redemption. And God's purchased you with his own blood, that unspotted blood of the Lamb, and he's protecting you from those spots. And when you're presented before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ, you're going to be presented undefiled and unspotted as his bride and as his wife. So hopefully that answered that question. God bless you, and we'll talk next time.